Thank you very much. You can all hear me? Okay, so um, this is a very kind introduction, and uh, it's very my, my very great honor to be speaking with you today uh, in support of those who suffer from muscular dystrophy. Muscu muscular dystrophy is a disease that causes muscles to weaken. I am lucky enough to be in the business of helping to build strength. And so I'm going to share with you a few of the ways that the organization I currently work for does just that. Going from the, the noble and the local, uh, from the lieutenant governor to the distant and far away. Okay, this photograph was taken in Accra, Ghana. Imagine a world, if you will, where publishing a letter to the editor could get you thrown in jail. Where covering politics consists of journalists taking envelopes of cash in exchange for publishing press releases verbatim. And where the only newspaper available is a form of the National Enquirer, the only radio, a version of Howard Stern, and the only thing on television is sports. This may help you give you some idea of the media environment in which the NGO that I work for conducts its affairs. What's missing from this world? Unbiased, informed voices, fact-based reporting and research that prizes accuracy and truth, reliable information. So imagine a situation like that. In extreme examples, the media works in an atmosphere of real fear. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we operate one of our largest programs, journalists, uh, on an average of one journalist a year, is disappeared or murdered in the course of their work. The media, too often in these countries, becomes the mouthpiece of power, not its watchdog. Through intimidation, poverty, and poor circumstance, the media becomes corrupt. Our solution? To strengthen local media in order to strengthen local voices, and in so doing, to strengthen democracy. So Journalists for Human Rights' vision and mission is to make everyone in the world fully aware of their rights. And we do that by enabling and encouraging the production of something we call rights media. Journalists for Human Rights works with African journalists to combat, combat the corruption I mentioned earlier. Our staff work in Sierra Leone, Ghana, Malawi, Liberia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo to help African journalists tell African stories to African and international audiences. The uh, definition of rights media is giving voice to the voiceless. So, uh, kids, for example, who are not getting a fair shake at education, villagers whose land is being expropriated, or whose water supply is being polluted by a plantation. Our journalists also work to hold authorities responsible for human rights abuses to account. The goal is to help Africans call on their own and international governments for change in their own voices. I came to this work by a roundabout route. As mentioned, I was the child of development workers, I grew up in Sub-Saharan Africa in the early 80s in two small countries, Lesotho and Swaziland, surrounded by apartheid-era South Africa. Lesotho is independent of South Africa, and as such, I went to an all-black school. I was the only white child for a long time, including, uh, apart from my brother. My classmates were the children of men earning bachelor wages, so not family wages, bachelor wages, mining gold and diamonds in South Africa. As a white child, trying to understand why the heck all my black friends were so damn poor, I learned one truth early. Far too often, those who do not tell their own stories in their own voices, but rather are sidelined or stereotyped by others, are those whose issues and concerns also end up sidelined. They lose out. I was a decent writer and decided that later in life, I wanted to work in journalism. I wanted to tell the stories others can't or don't want to hear. And in so doing, I hope to open up, open up new opportunities for those who don't normally see their issues aired in the national media. Again, I went through a roundabout route at one point, realizing that writing for, exclusively for social justice magazines would not let me pay the bills. 
Uh, so I did work for a business magazine at one point, which was fascinating, but also at times very frustrating. And when journalists for human rights advertised that they were looking for an international programs director, I was quick to apply. Within weeks of getting the job, I was off on a roller coaster ride of trips to check out our country programs and make sure things were on track. I learned the stories I will be telling you tonight as a result. Liberia is a small country settled by freed American slaves in the southwestern corner of West Africa. Until 2006, it was governed by Charles Taylor, whom you may have heard of, a notorious warlord now on trial for war crimes in The Hague. As the country that invented the child soldier, Liberia has some very particular problems with its education system. Currently, an entire generation of 22 to 25-year-old child soldiers is being reintegrated into the school system with moderate success. So last September, I visited Liberia for the first time. I was particularly keen to meet Theophilus Seaton, the hero of the story, a young newspaper reporter from the Heritage newspaper in Monrovia. The Heritage is a newspaper above an auto mechanic store. It has a print run of 1,000 and an estimated 2,000 readers. It has about 10 staff. I met Theo Seaton in his office, wiry, slight, and in his mid-twenties, Seaton slouched in a chair, sporting a cloth cap and an irreverent grin. He doesn't talk much, preferring to save his words for the printed page. He is like many other journalists in Liberia. He has a high school education. He is smart, he is strategic, he is absolutely dedicated to the craft of journalism, but he has no formal training. Journalists for Human Rights had sent Christopher Mason, the former Canada correspondent for the New York Times, to Monrovia to work at the Heritage with people like, Se like Seaton. Theo Seaton told me that after attending workshops that Chris ran on the rights of children, he wanted to investigate corruption in Liberia's school system. So in early July last year, he went to Edwin J. Goodridge School in Monrovia, where he found former child soldiers packed in with seven-year-olds, four to a desk. He interviewed the students and the staff and found that the school had not received funds in weeks. Teachers were not getting paid. On further investigation, he discovered that the problem went all the way up to the Minister of Education. Funds were not getting where they needed to go. And the children attending Edwin J. Goodridge School were missing out. Seton wrote up the story. When it was published, it pounded ears, which is one of my favorite phrases from Liberian English. The UN's radio station picked it up, and the story was broadcast all over the country. Eventually, it reached the president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She went down to the school to check out the situation for herself. On finding the school was in even worse shape than Seton's story reported, Ellen got tough. She suspended and then sacked her education minister for negligence and ordered funds be paid for, to the administration to rehabilitate the school. Thanks to Theo Seton and Chris Mason, the pupils got a better shot at their education Johnson Sirleaf's ministers learned that there were very public consequences to being caught snoozing or sequestering funds on the job. Theo Seaton became known throughout Liberia as the journalist who got the education minister sacked. And Chris Mason, the JHR trainer with whom Seaton had worked, made the front page of the heritage in thanks. That's what can happen when you give voice to the voiceless. Another story. The Everest of our programs, without question, is the one we run in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Congo is a beautiful country that sits on greater mineral wealth and hydroelectric power potential than any other African country. Unfortunately, it was also run by a thief, Mobutu Sese Seko, for much of its 50-year history of independence. Mobutu gave famous speeches where he encouraged the population to steal a little because the state would never be able to pay them enough to get by. It's an environment where there are literally no reliable rules. I visited the Congo last summer, and I was there to oversee the transition point from one country director to another. We now have this extraordinary Congolese radio journalist, Freddy Mata Matundu, 
as our country director. Getting around was rather exciting, uh, and I won't go into detail because I'm going to run out of time. Uh, but, uh, but you have probably heard that the Congo is, has, is described as the rape capital of the world. And while I was there, Freddy Mata negotiated a deal with the United Nations so that journalists, Congolese journalists could build coverage of the epidemic of sexual violence in the East. The result? The UN matched us dollar for dollar on an award series at the end of the year that saw Congolese journalists submitting features on this and other issues from all over the country. Features included articles on the as yet untold stories of the victims of rape, the children that result, and in one particularly powerful story, Taylor Touare of Le Fer, a JHR partner newspaper based in Kinshasa, tracked the trial of one notorious serial rapist to its conclusion, where he was brought to justice. The lesson for the community, rape is a crime, even in the Eastern Congo. Those who commit it cannot expect to get away with it with impunity forever. So, by helping journalists tell the stories of those who are not used to seeing their names, let alone their issues in the press, JHR is working to help strengthen local voices in five countries across Africa. In so doing, we are working to catalyze positive change in these communities. The goal is for people to tell their own stories through their own media, and in so doing, help define their better lives for themselves and strengthen their democracies. Strong voices plus strengthened media equals better lives and stronger democracy. And so for more information or to donate, check out www.jhr.ca. And if any of you are in Toronto next Friday, please come out to our fabulous fundraiser. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you very much. It was a great honor to meet you.